Hello everyone and welcome to this Vardin webinar about practical tips for improving your UX. I'm Mark and I'm really excited to have Yuso Kantonen with me today. Yuso is a UX team lead with a lot of experience in the topic at hand today. And I'm personally also very much looking forward to this presentation. Uh, but before we get to that, let's go through some housekeeping items. Uh, so today all lines will be muted throughout the webinar, but you can post questions using the questions panel that you can find in the lower right of your screen. Um, we'll reserve some time to answer any unanswered questions at the very end of the presentation. Um, and you will also receive an email afterwards with the slides and the link to the recording. Um, so many of you are probably familiar with Vardin already. So just a few words about us before we get going here and kind of maybe how today's topic is relevant for us. So um, at Vardin, our goal has always been to help developers create great web UIs for business applications. Uh, what that requires has changed quite a bit over the past 20 years or so. But one thing that kind of remains, remains constant is that more and more people are spending their workday in front of a screen, including us and our families and friends and so on. And we want the applications they use to help them to be more efficient and kind of reduce stress instead of increasing it. So to do this, we have created two open source frameworks, Vardin Flow and Hill. And Flow is what most ref refer to when they kind of say, I'm using Vardin. It's the kind of classical framework. And it allows you to create web UIs using plain Java. Uh, the framework handles communication, security, rendering, live updates, and, and so on. Hill has much of the same benefits, but instead you use um, TypeScript to connect the reactive UI, uh, or connect the reactive UI to your Java backend uh, in a type safe manner. So if you're comfortable with modern browser-based development, this model might feel uh, a bit more familiar. Uh, so one might say that Flow is the, uh, in Flow, the UI is server-driven, whereas in Hill, uh, it's more of a client-driven UI. Both come with a complete set of accessible UI web components. Um, and kind of by letting the framework handle all the generic challenges that are common to all applications, you can focus on making a good UX for the specific things your application is, is solving. So as mentioned, these are open source frameworks. Um, as a company, we provide tools and services to help even more, uh, which is actually why we have access to experienced experts like Yusa here uh, that are able to share their insights with us. Um, but one last thing we're going to do before we let Yusa loose uh, is we're going to do a few polls here to see kind of who we are and, and, and um, who you are, actually. So uh, we have four short questions for you today that will pop up on your screen. And when you submit your answer, you will be able to see live how each option is doing. So the first question is, uh, how do you describe the UX of the apps uh, you develop or work on? Great, good, okay, fair, needs work, or I don't know. And we can actually see live here that okay is a, a pretty popular option. Uh, many are doing good as well. This is nice to see, uh, but we also have needs work and fair. Uh, only a few are great, so uh, maybe we have a good presentation in front of us today here. 
So yeah, the first, the top two, okay and good, are definitely out ahead. And then uh, we have need, needs work and fair. And by the way, if you are watching the recording, this part will be a little bit boring, I think, because you can't actually see these live graphs updating. But okay is at 43%, good at 37 needs work at 15 uh, fair at 13 and great at two. So that seems to be stabilizing now quite well. So maybe we can do the next poll. Uh, and that is uh, who primarily designs the UX of apps you develop? So you can select multiple here. Internal designers, external resources, front-end developers, full-stack developers, managers, product managers, product owners, customers, users, or I don't know. And let's see how we are doing with these. So full-stack developers seems to be quite a bit ahead uh, with product managers coming in second here. Then we have front end developers and internal designers that are competing head to head quite closely. And we'll give this a few more seconds to see. We're still getting, getting in votes here. But yeah, it's pretty clear that full stack developers is, is the winner here. Uh, we have 40% going to that. Uh, then product managers uh, has 19%. So we have a pretty, pretty clear winner on this one. Uh, let's move on to the next one. How important is it to improve the UX of the apps you develop? And select one of extremely important, very important, somewhat important, not that important, no improvement is needed, or I don't know. And we can see the votes coming in. Very important is ahead, which is nice. It's not extremely important, but still. Uh, so yeah, currently we are almost at 50% with the very important. Somewhat important is in second place, 27%, and extremely important at 20%. And we have kind of stabi stabilized around that. So I think we can safely move on to the next poll. What are your biggest challenges in creating a great UX? And you can select multiple here. So lack of internal design experience, lack of external design exp expertise, uh, identifying what the UX issues are, understanding how to improve the UX to address issues, time and resources to make improvements or other. And let's see here. So time or resources to make improvements is ahead. And, and I guess this is not, not super much of a, of a surprise. Uh, coming in second is understanding how to improve the UX to address issues. Uh, then in third place, we have lack of internal design expertise. And these are quite, top three are quite close, actually top four, fourth one being identifying what the UX issues are, uh, are quite close with time and resources um, being ahead at 27%. Okay, I think that, did we have one last question I lost track of. No, I think we are done with the polling. 
Um, so I guess with that, we're kind of getting all warmed up. So, Yuso, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Mark. And yeah, hello everyone from, from my side as well. My name is Juuso Kantonen. I've been working at, at Baden for roughly seven, seven years as a, as a UX designer, currently a team, team lead of uh, for four UX designers, or a team of four. Um, interesting, interesting in the, in the polling, uh, interesting results in the, in the polling. Hopefully, in, in today's presentation, I can give some tips in, in uh, making, making the design process more, more efficient or how you can cut corners or save time and uh, still make a meaningful impact, impact through, the, through the design and, and uh, by, by making changes to your application. Here's a little bit of, of uh, agenda that I'll be talking, to, talking today. So we are starting with uh, a little bit of background, why, why paying attention to user, user experience matters in the first place. Then I'll be talking a little bit about the uh, design processes. Um, and then more like hands-on tips and tricks on improving your, your, your UX designs and also talking a little bit about testing and some tips and, tips and tricks in, in there. I'm trying to keep it very, very practical and and hands on. And as the last thing, I'll, I'll be talking very little bit about the UX services that, that we offer at, at Baden and the people that we have. Um, our angle to uh, applications, when I'm referring to applications, I'm mainly talking about these uh, enterprise applications, business applications, workplace applications field. So the type of applications that are used to uh, doing very specific, specialized tasks and use that workplaces uh, to fulfill, fulfill like daily tasks. Uh, in contrast, consumer apps might have a slightly different, different focus as they typically need to attract users and compete with, with other applications while, while the business and workplace applications are more that the uh, users are forced in a way to use those applications they don't they don't have the choice to use something else instead if the if the experience isn't isn't something they enjoy so uh to me that actually means that you should be paying even more attention into the user experience of of your workplace app um so why why does why does this thing uh matter or why is it important so uh, it's essential in improving efficiency of, of people's daily work. So uh, having less, less friction in the interactions means less errors, higher productivity, and happier users. So there's very strong like a people aspect to the whole, whole topic of user experience. But there is also, also like a business payback that uh, less errors means higher higher productivity and those errors for example can be can be quite costly at at times and people will will uh, be happier as employees when, when their workplace applications are something that they uh, enjoy or at, or at least are not coming in the way in the in the daily work then i wanted wanted to talk a little bit about uh, who can do uh, ux design so these are some of the characteristics that are commonly associated with, with uh, designers, that designers would need to be highly trained. Uh, you need to have like an artistic eye or that kind of view, view uh, mentality in, into things. You need to be a creative thinker or you need to be an excellent facilitator. And in reality, I would say that none of those really, really hold, hold true. So, uh, of course, like a, a uh, online course and education programs can be a very good starting point into, into getting into the topic, but still you don't need like a, a several year uh, degree or, or training to be able to do UX design. You just simply need to understand the very, very like basic building blocks and be able to apply 
those principles in, in your own designs. Many of those principles are, are pretty simple in the in the end. Um, so something I wanted to mention that uh, like UX uh, educations are fairly fairly new thing nowadays. There are like education programs uh, aiming aiming towards uh, UX career, but in the, in the past many of the uh, UX designers have have like a background in either graphic design way from, from coming from more like visual angle or from technical roles like being a front end developer who have turned into into full time designers at, at some point. Um, the commonly commonly heard thing is the artistic eye or whatever that that means and I, I would counter argument that visuals are only actually a very very small part of the whole palette so if if you don't like working with like visual visual things it might not still be a a, a blocker um, instead of being like super creative I would say that it's it's enough that you you are able to follow best practice and and be like problem solving and, and that mentality helps helps you a long way you don't need to be reinventing the wheel or, or doing something unique all the time um, being being like a good in having good facilitation skills does help but it's more about like uh, liking to work with people and being analytical and, and having that like problem solving mindset is is, is a key I think um, I promised to talk a little bit, a little bit about the design process. I did a simplification into these four four different steps, and uh, here I'm mainly talking about uh, user interfaces and designing UIs. Um, but basically, the same principles apply to, for example, service design or API design. The same steps could be could be still followed there. Um, when talking about design. Uh, there are some some uh, commonly known methodologies for for doing design. Like uh, design thinking is one. Double diamond process is more more for any type of of design. Design sprints by Google Ventures is very very like a uh, well defined framework for solving solving problems etc. Et but I think uh, all of those share the very very same basic steps uh, in in those methodologies. So we're starting with. Uh, defining a, a problem to solve. This is done uh, through user research. So you need to involve, involve the end users, do interviews, do field research, service analytics, wh whatever you need to understand uh, what, the, what, the, what kind of issues the, the users are facing. Um, then identify the requirements. There might be user requirements, there might be functional requirements, there might be business requirements. Uh, sometimes those are well aligned, sometimes they are not, and you need to be making making the calls that what who am I actually serving out of this and what, what are the issues that I'm trying to solve with my design. So kind of in order to be able able to be successful with your design, you need to have a goal. You know, need to know where you're aiming. Otherwise, it's just going to be like a shot in the dark and, and, and you're hoping that, OK, maybe it went in the, in the right direction. Um, I had like a car or repair shop metaphor here that if you're if you're bringing your car to get the engine oils changed changed at a at a shop, but then you pick up your car and they haven't touched the motor, but they changed the windshield as that was correct. It's not really like yeah, it's an improvement on the car, but it's not really really doing what like solving your issue. So. Even even the overall experience, user experience, or overall uh, car would be would be improved. It's if it doesn't solve the right issues, it's it's not that much of a of a use. Um, some practical tips already already here. Uh, stakeholders are often like presenting a presumed problem and a and a solution to that problem, asking asking you that okay, please fix this. Uh, quite many times, it's important to like step up, take a step backwards and gain an like an overall understanding of an issue to be sure that you are actually uh, fixing the root cause instead of uh, adding yet another patch and a patch uh, on on top of the uh, experience or the or the application UI. 
Another tip here is that if if the real users are out of reach, so you can't can't talk to real end users, uh, still do talk to someone to clear uh, any any assumptions that you might be making on your own. So talk to product owners, domain experts, who whoever basically can provide you more in depth uh, info on how the how the users are <clears throat> using the application or or what, what the application is, is trying to solve for the users. <clears throat> then the uh, next step in the, in the process is exploring solutions. And uh, this means generating a, a vast set of ideas. So this can be brainstorming, workshops, benchmarking uh, with, with other team members. It doesn't need to be strictly coming from, coming from only the designer, but involve a lot of people come up with new new ideas, even even like wild and crazy, crazy ideas. Um, don't settle on, on one single idea too early on. Um, then the UI UX design, as we as we typically think of it, is is happens in this uh, exploring the solutions phase. So here you do wireframing, interaction design, visual design, basically define how something looks, how a UI user interface looks and how it works, how it behaves, what, what are the interactive elements, and so on. Again, some uh, tips in here. Uh, there's no, no value, really, in being very unique and original. You should steal as much as, as, much as you can. Uh, so find inspiration in other applications, in design systems, in I'm mentioning Tribble as that's a very good resource uh, for visual things and, and sometimes also for like uh, usage patterns on, on how others are doing. So you can compare and, and uh, take inspiration from there. Then the uh, other tip I have is that know your application's framework and don't work against it. So know the, be aware of the technical limitations you should know when you are kind of bending the limits and, and when you are uh, following the framework. So many times we we see that uh, a designer who is not aware of anything uh, Bonin specific, but has has made a design that is supposed to be implemented in Bonin, the developers are complaining that it's it's too far off or it's too too difficult to implement. So. Uh, it doesn't need, necessarily mean that you need to need to like uh, cut corners or, or make exceptions on on your on your design. But it's more like knowing the uh, borders in order to be able to uh, stretch them. Then uh, once you once you have explored different solutions, select the best idea out of those. Put some uh, time into creating a prototype and a, and a presentation out of it. Uh, for example, Figma and Invision are good, good tools for creating, creating these interactive prototypes. If it's more of a uh, development uh, specific thing, you could even, even do like a minimum viable implementation, small technical demo of, of the thing. Um, as part of it design, it's, it's often overlooked any, any kind of documentation and annotation in the, in the designs, but it, it comes very helpful later on in the, in the process when handing off the designs. Once you have your, uh, sorry, a few, few more tips. So uh, I mentioned uh, Figma and uh, Invision as prototyping tools, but essentially you can use any tooling you're efficient with. So, for example, some some of those people are using PowerPoint or any any slideshow slideshow uh, applications to just set like couple uh, screenshots one after each other and kind of simulate that. Okay, if you clicked here, what would happen? What would the inter interaction? A different screen uh, comes in and so on. That can be uh, quite helpful in getting people to talk and provide meaningful feedback. Uh, you should kind of try to direct the discussions more towards how the uh, experience is not only the visual, how everything looks, but how uh, what kind of data is, is shown, how did the, did the navigation 
events, for example, reveal what the what they were expecting and so on. So focus more on the inter interactions and the and the flows rather than the uh, how everything looks in the in the application. And also uh, another tip I had in here that you should be focusing more on on showing things through your prototype instead of adding lots of annotations and arrows pointing that okay. Uh, this is this is what this means, and, and you use this like that. So le let the uh, testers figure that out out themselves, and try to try to make your UI as clear as possible that it's like self-explanatory. Then, once you have your prototype set up, uh, collect feedback using it. You can do very like formal testing as usability. Uh, testing, monitor testing, like surveys, AP testing, whatever, or very informal testing, like simply uh, talking talking with your users, showing, showing, some, uh, showing the prototype to them, uh, talking to domain experts, stakeholders, other designers, whoever you can, can reach. And it's also quite important to capture and categorize that feedback. I, I do have, have the tendency, tendency myself that yeah, I'll, I'll memorize everything, but you, you, it tends to get, get lost when, especially when there's like a lot of feedback. A few more tips in here uh, at this stage of a of, of a process. Um, so sometimes you need to simply accept that that the real users are out of reach. Uh, so still, it's not not a reason to skip this step altogether. You should be showing your design to someone. Pretty much, pretty much anyone can provide meaningful feedback uh, on on how understandable something is. Um, the next tip is to outline kind of uh, what elements are open for for feedback and what what are not. Uh, that might, might can help in in gaining more valuable insights. For example, are, are you looking for feedback regarding how? Clear all, all your text is is everything like uh, labeled, labeled clearly, or is it is it more about the visuals? And then uh, as the last step, uh, last tip, be very much aware of different biases. Uh, this could include, for example, the sunken cost bias that you have worked very hard on something, so that makes it good, or it has to be good because I spent so much time and effort on this. And on the other hand, uh, your testers or people you're talking to uh, might be biased to not hurt your feelings because they know that okay, you worked two weeks on this, so they don't want to shoot it down, even if it's if it's not not good or not ideal. So try to steer away from from that. Uh, another typical bias bias that you can experience is uh, confirmation bias. So you have kind of formed your own hypothesis on, on something and you're only looking for things to confirm your hypothesis. That happens, happens at times. Yeah, next up we will be uh, diving deeper into, into like practical tips. Uh, something I wanted to mention here is that uh, essentially every product does have a user experience, whether someone has very carefully crafted it, designed it, or if it's some, something that just happened. So first of the, of the tips, I'm kind of repeating myself, but know your users and, and their goals. Uh, so if you don't, don't really know, uh, haven't defined your goal, don't know your users, it's, it's going to be a shot in the, in the dark. You might hit the, hit the mark, maybe it's going in the right direction, or sometimes it's, it's not, and you have no way of, of knowing, really, if you, if you don't know what you're, what you're aiming at. The next tip is to, uh, in, in the designs, use real data and real context. So sometimes we, we do see that uh, designers kind of uh, put together a UI, and then they add data that fits their UI, while it should be the other way around, that you start with the real data, which is typically, there's too much of it, it's hard to understand, it's poorly formatted, it contains all kinds of weird edge cases. And the designer's task is to make sense of it and kind of form the UI around that data, not the other way around. 
Also, uh, regarding real context, uh, do test out your, your design, uh, designs in real devices and real screen sizes. Do you consider like the small, smaller viewports, but also the like very large viewports? Can, can the uh, users typically have multiple monitors? How, how do you adapt to that situation, etc.? Also, uh, one, one thing that is often overlooked is the kind of empty state that before any data is added to your application or, or you, you start putting the data points together, what does the application show at that point? Is it still, still like, do those views make sense before they are configured? Then uh, this is something I, I earlier mentioned as well, but more practical example. So uh, for example, if you're, if you're tasked to create a combo box or a selection dropdown component or use something like that, uh, it's a good idea to, to look into how others are, are solving the same issue. Here's four screenshots from different design systems. So pick the best pieces, pick, pick the ones that you like the most, and remix those to make your own version. It's it doesn't really provide value in in like uh, reinventing the wheel and and like uh, doing something totally different than, from from what the others are doing. Kind of the reasoning for that there is a, a uh, UX law uh, called Jacobs law, which goes: users spend most of their time on other sites. This means that users prefer your site to work the same way as all the other sites they already know. So that kind of means that uh, following web conventions makes it makes the application very easy to learn. Uh, from prior experience, you already know how a combo box works when it's like this and not something totally uh, crazy and, and unique. Then uh, seeking balance between form and function. Um, here I have two examples. This is the pure HTML elements, and this is kind of the same same form, but with a little bit of, of polish and, and styling. And studies actually show that the uh, visually pleasing design creates a positive response in people's brain and leads them to think that the design actually works better. Uh, so even though the performance of, of these two would be exactly the same, still people see this one being better and faster and more, more efficient. Uh, something I, I need to mention here is that still keep your uh, visuals very minimalistic and don't add any like decorative elements. That's, that's not what I'm, I'm trying to state, state in here. Um, then one of my favorite topics is, is consistency. So uh, visually and functionally consistent UIs are easier to learn and they are faster to use. So people recognize the, the elements instead of, instead of uh, the UI introducing new patterns and new, new things all the time. Also, uh, from a developer's point of view, uh, developing such, such UIs is faster and the maintenance is easier when we are reusing the, reusing, reusing, reusing the elements. Uh, design system approach is kind of kind of a, a good way of ensuring high high consistency. So you should be paying attention to your color palettes, typography variations, sizing and spacing, and how navigation flows go in your application. Here on the presentation, I have four different cards. Uh, each of those showing totally different content, but still they use the same colors, the same typography, uh, same spacing. So they kind of belong together. You can quite easily grasp where is it the title for the card. That these are like uh, on the on the same level, similar type of elements. So that's helpful. Then uh, accelerators, guidance, and customization. So you should be taking the user's varying level of experience and preferences into into account. Uh, accelerators. Uh, are done for experienced users. So those might include uh, keyboard shortcuts uh, to trigger certain actions, or for example, context menus that, that can contain like shortcuts and quick links to, 
to some parts of the application. Uh, for new users, you, you want to have more like guidance. So any kind of helper texts, uh, tool tips, onboarding tours, uh, in-app user manuals are typically useful for, for them. Here I have a, a screenshot from, from Slack application and they, they do this uh, like a in-application manual and it's a page that actually shows uh, keyboard shortcuts for, for the application. Um, the third one, the customization essentially means uh, that, for example, if you take a data table, the user should be able to customize how the data is presented there. They, they would have the possibility to hide some columns, reorganize, re reorder the columns, and that should be stored to the uh, user user's preferences. So the next time the same user comes back, they get the same presentation of the of the grid. And that that can uh, boost their efficiency quite a lot. Another uh, use case of customization might be, uh, for example, search presets, that if you have uh, like a large set of filters, you could, that you're often, often using and re like repeatedly using the same filters, you could save those as a preset. So instead of typing in five different fields, you could pick from a preset and run, run your search with that. So that's top of the customization. So coming more like user specific and user customizable and uh, allowing such cases is, is very beneficial. Then uh, accessibility is something that is not only for uh, people with disabilities, but, but it actually has benefits for all, all users. So especially keyboard operability, uh, having clear visuals in your application, having easy to understand content, it benefits everyone, not only disabled users. So do pay attention to contrasts, font sizes, uh, having meaningful structure in your application, uh, the fo focus and hover stars being, being visible, etc. cetera. Uh, other accessibility topics include the screen reader support, so using area tags and having the correct semantic structure on the, on the components and in, in the views will ensure uh, good coverage for the, for the screen readers. And then uh, as the last tip, I have this, uh, don't be afraid of clicks. So there is a, a fairly well-known uh, rule, three click rule, uh, which says that anything that isn't reachable with three clicks uh, is, is too difficult to find or, or people get frustrated in, in, in like after three clicks. And that is, that is a myth. Uh, there are no, no studies showing anything, anything like that. It's more like uh, if you click and do a series of clicks and you don't feel like you're progressing at all, that is, that is what turns off, off people. So the kind of the difficulty with, with trying to minimize the number of clicks is that your UIs can come uh, very like supercharged with different controls and different, different uh, actions. So having everything at hand at the same time, while you should be like uh, limiting limiting the options that the user can take and, and try to keep it keep it more focused. Then a uh, few few tips on on testing. So these are something that everyone can can utilize. I'll try to skim through quickly. Um, so sharing your designs, showing them to pretty much anyone and you don't need to explain it too much, showing it and, and asking for feedback that do they get what is in, in there. Then uh, it's always a good idea to uh, conduct proper like user testing if you have any, any more complicated workflows. So this could be as simple as writing a short scenario of, of what, what the test, tester is trying to achieve and then uh, do a prototype, click through prototype and let them use it and, and observe uh, how, how they are doing. Do they get stuck? Do they need help in, in finding their way, way across? Uh, anonymous testing, testing services can be, can be good for uh, cases where you don't need, need like a very specialized 
experience to use user applications. So something that has a has a public access and any anyone can use. Uh, it's also like a good tool for clearing assumptions. Uh, some services to mention are user brain and maze.co. So uh, you can post a either a link to an application or even a Figma prototype file, and uh, you will get anonymous people people uh, using your your design and leaving leaving feedback that did they understand what's going on there and, and so on. The five second test it means that you show a design mockup uh, to someone, and then after five seconds you take it away. Uh, this can help or uh, help uh, testing for clarity and the first impressions that they, what are the first elements they pay attention to. So after showing it, you can ask questions like, what was the whole thing about? Or what, what is the main thing you recall from, from, the, from the design? Then uh, if you don't have simply anyone to talk to, uh, these are some, some tips for like self-evaluating your, your designs. So just by looking at a, a, I'm more talking about screen designs, just by looking at, at a design, can you tell which elements in there are interactive? So do you use like a certain color to mark all the, all the interactive things? It's quite typical to have these kind of like lists uh, that I have in the, in the screenshot. And you don't really know that are, are those supposed to be like interactive or, or not without hovering so the visual should, should, should communicate that. Another thing that you can ask yourself uh, is that, can you tell where you are in the, in the navigation hierarchy? So in this example, I'm, I'm using a uh, main navigation to indicate that we are on a stock market view, which belongs under the assets group in the wealth manager application. So kind of providing some kind of, it could be uh, breadcrumbs, it could be any other means to give context on, on what, what are you currently looking at if, if you didn't land on this page through the, through the navigation or did, are, are not aware of, the, of the, what previously happened. Uh, this can be very, very helpful also in situations when uh, you're in the middle of a, a lengthy workflow then you get a phone call or you go for a lunch and you come back. Can you easily pick up that? What was I doing? Where am I? Uh, and so on. Another uh, tip, there's two, two more to go, um, is that you should always provide like a escape hatch in your UI. So you should be able to cancel any 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 workflows or or undo any changes that you recently did. So uh, sometimes we, we see that you have a form and you only have a like, button to save. So to go away from that view, you would need to take like a leap of faith, so to say, to use the main navigation or the browser back button and hope that none of the entries that you did in the form will be saved or maybe they will be saved. You don't quite know, so there needs to be like an explicit way to exit a exit the view, view or workflow. And then the uh, last one this is not not as much of a tip, but more of a uh, collection of, of the of the previous that you should be uh, focusing on a, a small number of important problems, uh, the ones that have the biggest impact on your application. For example, uh, your application's admin view might be seeing two or three users very occasionally using it, but those views having tons of issues and usability problems, uh, while your main view, let's say a dashboard view, might see all the, all the users of the application are going through that view, and that is very polished, but only has like few tiny things that could be better. Maybe you should still focus to those those issues as they have a bigger impact on the on the user experience at, rather than the admin admin views. But it's always like a balance, balancing balancing act that who should you share. But kind of the guidance is to is to focus on the on the issues that have the most significant impact. 
Um, that was all the tips. Uh, hopefully you find something helpful in there. Um, if all of this feels overwhelming, we can, can help you forward. So we do have uh, UX services at Baden. So we have four UX designers uh, working with our, our clients, helping our customers in, in coming up with like, concepts for their, for their application, doing like research, doing uh, design work, coming up with UI mockups. And also all, all of us are uh, capable of doing implementation of our designs, implementing them in Baden technologies. Uh, our team has seen quite a, a big number of, of projects, which gives us very good exposure in, in various industries. So the, those include like healthcare applications, finance applications, process industry, and, and, and so on. Uh, mobile applications, different different types of different types of things. And I'm not saying it's it's like for better or worse, but sometimes uh, product designers. Who might have a very like long career, but in in their whole career they might ha might have only worked with one or two applications for for several years. So we have that exposure. That's that's kind of our our benefit. And as the last point, our uh, satisfaction score is is very high, which I'm of course very very proud of. Uh, so it's four point eight out of five. This is actually the, the figure for uh, 2021, but I, I simply didn't didn't find our latest score yet, or didn't update it here. I I would assume that we are still on on the same ballpark level. So yeah, that's pretty much everything I had in in mind for today's presentation. I guess it. We would have some sometimes some time still for for going through some questions. Yes, that was really interesting and, and insightful and kind of practical tips. And I think actually the questions have been fairly practical and and we've been able to answer uh, mm -hmm. most of it. But um, I guess related to the last point, or or maybe we can start there is is uh, I know my application UX could be improved, but I don't know where to start, any tips. And kind of these services, I was just looking at the slide and thinking, yeah, how, how do I, you know, figure out what I need even? Right, right, yeah. Uh, one of the services we, we have is, is called a UX review. So uh, that, that means that one of our, our experts will, will uh, Go through through your applications, point out any usability issues there there are, uh, suggest even even some solutions to those. But it, it's mainly uh, aimed for kind of discovering where your issues issues are. The other way, if if you want to do it on on your own, is talking to your end users again, uh, trying to understand that okay, uh, what what are they what are they doing. Do they uh, find like workarounds on their daily basis? Uh, many times the uh, people are attaching like uh, post-it notes on their desk uh, simply because they they uh, can't recall all the information they need to fulfill some workflows. So those are very good pointers and like uh, uh, things that can can get you. Uh, into discovering more or learning more about the challenges that the application might might have, and sometimes it's not even 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 like uh, issues. It might be more like uh, opportunities for improving the experience. Yeah, th those are very good points. Yeah, uh, and good starting points. Uh, also, do you have any resources to recommend to get started with UX? I guess this is more like to learn yourself and kind of read up on the... Yes, uh, I, I didn't prepare like a full full list of links. Uh, something I, I find myself often often referring to, basically I'm, I'm quite, quite aware of the basics. So I'm often using the uh, public design systems. To mention a few, SAP Fiori has a pretty good design system that are uh, geared towards like enterprise applications. So simply like uh, 
that's more like inspiration for different solutions that how, how are they solving some of their issues. Uh, IBM Carbon is a good one. They include some use cases as well. There's a number of others. So looking into different design systems is, is like seeing how others are doing is, is one way of, of learning, learning UX. Uh, I mentioned briefly the laws of, of UX. There is a website called Laws of UX, which kind of gives you some of the very basic principles that people people follow and that are taken as like uh, good guidelines for, for coming up with a, a usable user interface. Also, uh, Nielsen's heuristics, there's 10 of those, gives a pretty good baseline for evaluating a user experience of a, of a product. Yeah, and those have been kind of timeless. I mean, they have existed for forever and still apply. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah, that made me remember one of my own. I think uh, the book "Don't Make Me Think" by Steve Krug. Yeah, yep. something like that. Um, so yeah, that was a, a book that gets you. It's been a while since I read it, but just kind of gets you into the mindset and kind of takes away kind of. So you realize that this is not black magic or anything. It's kind of uh, takes it to a level that's uh, good to get started with. Uh, then, yeah, the, more yeah. If, if we're gonna add, add in the "Don't make me think" is is a very good book in the sense that it's actually fun to read, while yeah. mo most of the like professional literature isn't. But it, it's a nice book, and it's it's not that big. It's fairly, fairly small. yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. It's a, so if it for a starting point that's that's really actually quite good also something that was very approachable for me f more recently was uh called refactoring ui i think which was more of a ebook e uh, e type of thing pdf uh, which had kind of small practical tips and i i guess that if you don't get use exactly what it says you kind of also get a lot of information around why you would do it that way or kind of uh, so small wish all hints. I think that was a lot around which you touched upon um, uh, with consistency being important and how you do kind of split your UI so that there's a clear hierarchy in, in things. So yeah. you actually can, it's not just, even if it, it makes it look good, but it also helps you find the things you're looking for and so on. So, right. That yeah, was that's helpful. something about like I mentioned that consistency is one of, one of my favorite things. That it's it's very difficult to give like instructions that, for example, in a toolbar, the buttons should be on the left or should be aligned to the right, or the field labels should be at the top or they should be at the left of the field doesn't really matter that much. It depends. It depends <laughs> on the use cases. But what, what, what is important that once you go with something, keep it consistent. So all of your views and all, all of the functionalities are not different. As long as it's consistent, your users will, will learn those patterns and they, they will be more efficient using it when, when everything is following the same, same patterns. Yeah, and I really liked your advice as well to steal as much as you can <laughs> along the same uh, lines that uh, often in in applications where you are trying to get something done, it's not kind of helpful to ma make some new inventions for simple things that you are kind of the same in all applications. It's better to just do it the same way and then focus on something that your application is specifically uh, kind of solving for. How can you make that more, more smooth? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a, a practical question here that I'm going to ask because I was actually <clears throat> touching the tool that was mentioned last week. <laughs> so we have, um, we have our design system in Figma, so we, you can use it there. But there's an uh, open source tool called Penpot. Uh, and I know that this has been in our chat, but so... The question is, do we have plans to uh, move our like component library over over to that? I would say that we don't probably have any plans right now, but we have noticed the product. So <laughs> that's kind of also, I guess that's a tip for everyone that that's actually a 
um, a tool that you can can use. But I wanted to check with you that yeah, we don't have any official plans for. No, we don't. No, we don't. Yeah. But, but yeah, kind of, kind of aligning with the with the uh, platform. If you're designing what an application is. Highly recommended to look up the uh, Figma button design system assets in there. It's it's available in the in the Figma community uh, thingy. So it, we have all the all the button components drawn out drawn out it there. So even if if you are not like super specialized in Figma, it helps you in just tracking and dropping uh, com components on the canvas, and you can be quite efficient with that. Yeah, it, it really is like all these suggestions to use some tool to kind of lay out your mm -hmm. idea and kind of if you have an idea that maybe I want to change this UI this way, try it out in something that you can drag around the things mm -hmm. uh, can be quite helpful instead of, uh, I like to code myself, but going back and forth and moving things around in, in code can be quite a lot uh, slower and Mm. Uh, yeah, so these two tools are quite helpful and having the whole component set in Figma has been like awesome. You can just quickly uh, drag some things out and kind of get a feel for how it would work. Yeah, I'm often saying that that uh, since the intro uh, introduction of that, I've been using much more time designing and less time drawing. So, Yeah, <laughs> yeah good one. Yes, uh, let's see. I think that we are kind of closing in on time here. So uh, I think I will uh, stop here. And uh, and uh, was a, at least I had fun. It was a really good, uh, really good practical tips. And I guess to everyone that joined, thank you. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you.